Our Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you, God, uh, for everyone here. And now, Lord, anoint your word in only the way you can, in your precious name. Amen. Now, when he went out from his country from there, he came to his own country. His disciples are following after him. So we've been learning about Jesus is always continuing to do good. In season and out of season, when he feels like it, when he's prayed up and he's ready to go out, when he's exhausted, when his pillow's wet from a boat ride, whatever's happening, Jesus is ready to serve. And we take our example from Jesus. What did Jesus do? That's what we want to be doing. But here we see Jesus felt it in his heart to go back to his homeland. Ladies, this is not Bethlehem. This is where he was raised and educated. It was Nazareth. And here we see Jesus going, let's go through the homeland. And you know how that is. Some of you uh, aren't from Yucca Valley. And you go back home. And you, you want to minister to your friends there that you've news to know and your family there. Well, that's what Jesus' heart was. He goes, you know what? I've been ministering around, but I want to go back to Nazareth. And I want to minister there. And here we see in verse 2, when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did the man get these things? And what wisdom was given to him that such mighty works are performed by his very own hands? What is interesting in verse 2, and wherever Jesus went, there were always so many people following him. There were crowds upon crowds. There were people that were letting down their friends on ropes in front of his uh, feet to lay hands on him. Everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd. But... It says here that Jesus went out and when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. There wasn't the big throng of people in his hometown. Didn't say when he hit Nazareth, they all went, our local boys done good and come home. And let's go out and greet our prophet who was raised by Mary and Joseph. Let's go out there and welcome him. Let's put a banner up, Savior of the world. There was nothing. He got there. And there was no great crowd. In fact, he waits to teach till the Sabbath. Doesn't that just amaze you? How he could come back to where he grew up and they didn't accept him? And then they looked at each other astonished and saying, Where did the man get these things? As though he went out somewhere and purchased them. As though he was, did some, something and now he is able to do this. Trying to put Jesus into their own box. Who is this man? Why is he here? And we know where you came from. And that wisdom that he has been given to him, such mighty works are even performed by his hands. They know he's doing amazing things. But the big throng of people... He waited till Sunday or the Sabbath to preach. They couldn't wrap their minds around his divine nature. And ladies, sometimes your family members are going to have a hard time wrapping their minds around the change in your life. Your friends are going to have a hard time wrapping their minds around what you used to be and now what you are. And that's what was going on. These people could not wrap their minds around the illegitimate boy grown up doing miracles. Because see, their unbelief is clouding them. And so they don't want to believe that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and that baby just grew within him, within Mary. They are adhering to, Mary got knocked up. That's that illegitimate boy. Isn't that nice of Joseph to marry her? Who knows whose kid it really is? Can you imagine? And Jesus walks into that and he wants to own them. They are his loved ones. They are his relatives. And they are looking at him with speculation. Who are you? And maybe that's what's happening in your world. Who are you to tell me? 
I never did the things that you did. Don't preach at me, little girl. Don't preach at me, sister. I know you. And this is what Jesus is facing. They can't wrap their mind around it. There's a special on TV coming out. Um, and it's uh, studying Jesus. And um, it's not going to be a good thing. It's on the Discovery Channel. I heard it advertised the other day. Gerald and I were sitting there. And they said, you walk with this and look at the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these people never even knew Jesus and wrote about him. Hello? Have you read their writing of what they saw? New special on TV, and they're announcing it like it's some big thing. Here it says that he went there, verse 3. Is this not just the carpenter, the son of Mary? Got it? Uh, no, daddy. Got it? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary? The son of the Holy Spirit? No. And the brother James and Jos and Judas and Simon? And are there not their sisters that were with us? So they, so they were and they were offended at him. Isn't this just that boy that grew up? You know, Mary's. Who is he to come and tell us? He's a nobody. It amazes me how they could look at what Jesus had done, healing the miracles, healing, raising people from the dead, and they still didn't believe. And verse 4 it says, And Jesus said to them, because he knew what they were thinking, Isn't this the illegitimate boy? Isn't this the boy without a dad? And look what Jesus he had goes right to their thoughts. He attacks right to their thoughts. And he says, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Jesus is saying, This is what you are thinking. And he said, I'm accepted everywhere but here. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're accepted everywhere. You're loved in Yucca Valley. You're loved here. And then you go home and you find that. And you find that criticism that waits for you there. You know what I'm going to just tell you here in verse 5. And it talks about Jesus went on to do mighty works. Jesus continued on. Because we have a temptation when people that we really love talk to us and talk down to us and have something critical to say about your life with Jesus to stop. Do you know that? Because it hurts that it hurts. And that is the real people that deep down you care about. Even if you say, I haven't talked to my sister in two years, you still love her. And you know what? Deep down, deep, deep down, when they shun you for your relationship with Jesus Christ, that hurts you. And if anything can make you stop coming to church, loving the Lord, going forward, it will be a close friend or a family member that will say, I know who you are. This is just a crutch. And here he says, verse 5, he could do no mighty work there except he laid hands on a few sick and people there and healed him. Can you imagine? He says here, he could do no mighty work there. In verse 6 it says, He marveled at their unbelief. Can you imagine the creator of the universe, who is equal with God the Father, marveling at something? <laughs> Think about that. He knows everything. He made everything. But the Bible said he marveled. And what did he marvel at? His creation's unbelief. I choose not to to believe. And Jesus is there, God with flesh on, working miracles, saving people, raising them from the dead. They choose not to believe. Has that ever been you and your family? They can see, they can see what's happened. They can see you're blessed. They know you're not the same person, but they marvel with that unbelief and they just go, I don't even believe who you are. Jesus here is marveling at them. 
and their unbelief that he is who he says he is. He's accepted everywhere but back home. Verse 7, he called to himself twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Do you know what I love about this? He sends them out two by two. And the reason why he's doing that is that they're going to need to help each other. They're going to need along the way not to become discouraged. So instead of sending them out one, you go here, you go there, you go... He sends them out two by two. Because when one gets tired, or one gets discouraged, the other one can say, Hey, what great things are happening here. And then when this little optimistic one gets discouraged, the one over here can go, Hey, good things are happening here. He knows. He sends them out two by two. Because he knows our nature. And here, if you want to turn back over here with me... In Deuteronomy, in fact, you don't have to turn with me. I'm sorry. Exodus, I'll just read it to you. Exodus chapter 12, verse 10. And I'm going to be reading here about uh, Moses. And it says, So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Am- Amalek. And the Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the mountain. And so it was when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses and his hands became very heavy. So they took a stone and they put it underneath him and they sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported the hands, one on one side and one on the other, until, and his hands became steady until the going down of the sun. And then Joshua defeated Amalek and his people at the edge of the sword. They saw that Moses' hands were getting tired. And so here we see Aaron, and here we see her coming up, because when Moses kept his hands out, Joshua prevailed. But when his hands started to get tired, the battle was going to be defeated. And so they saw the need. And ladies, I want to tell you this morning, we need to be looking for the need in others. Not the need in ourselves. Okay? We need to be looking around and seeing what we can do to help the needs of others. I like Aaron and her. I like how they looked at Moses and said, what can we do to help him? What can we do to keep those hands raised in victory? What can we do? I know what we can do. You get one hand, I'll get the other, and we'll win together. We win together. It's not an island. It's not one person doing it all. It's we win together. And that's what it is with Nogme's home. Together, we are going to be able to bless Nogme. I don't know why the Lord put that on my heart. I have a lot to do. But I'm telling you, I know that I know it was from God. And you know what? Us all together... Sending out those letters on the email, doing whatever we can, can change a little bit of the pain. I pray with the holiday seasons, we are looking around saying, who can we help? What can we do to help relieve some pain? You know, I talked with you about this girl that, with this X-rated uh, porn store out there. What can we do for those people? What can we do for that girl? But just don't pull up and yell at her. Pull up and hand her a card. Tell her a Bible verse about Jesus and have a gift certificate in there to Starbucks. You are worth something. You are a beautiful woman. And God loves you. Let's love on her. Wouldn't that be a great idea? She's expecting some old woman to pull in there and go, What do you think of that shot? Break it. Let's love on it. Can't you see me out there? Give me that sign. (laughs) Let's love on her. Let's love on that girl. Let's fight fire with love. Let's do it, ladies. Let, Let her know Joshua Springs loves her and cares about her. And one by one, those cars just pull in. Here you go, honey. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. He has something awesome for you to do. He marveled at their unbelief. And he called twelve to him. Do 
you know what I love about how Jesus called 12 to them right now? And he's going to send them out two by two. Jesus looks and he says, I need you two to go over here. I need you guys to start something over here. Does that remind you of anything going on in our church? need you guys to take up the cross over that way. We need somebody over here in Ely, Nevada. We need somebody over here. And Jesus is starting to send them out two by two. But they do not have a college degree. (laughs) They do not have a college degree. They are being used without a college degree. How could that possibly be? How could God use you without a college degree? And knowing what the, what the ark was made from. Was it made from gopher wood? Or was it made from trees of Lebanon? How can God use somebody that isn't got a degree? Well, let me tell you something. He's doing it right here. And Jesus looks and he says, You two, take what you have. You know what you believe. I'm going to use you. Chuck Smith, I I used to love his teaching on this, and he'd say, sometimes seminary turns into a cemetery. They go off with all these big, wonderful ideas of what they're going to do to change the world, and they come back, and they fit right into the mold of the world, and they're dead. We want to be alive, and we want to do what Jesus wants us to do with what we have right now. With what you have right now is enough. Okay? You're not going to learn something brand new that is going to cause you to be able to preach it better than you know it right now. Ladies, you know it right now. Just do it. Do within your means, with your sphere of influence, what you can do for kingdom thinking, for Jesus Christ. We have everything right now. And Jesus said, you go out and you go two by two and change the world. When uh, Tracy and I went out to Africa, there was no reason it should be us doing that in Africa. There was no reason for her to have a burden in her heart other than God just put it there. God puts things on your heart so you will do them. Whether it's a mile race, whether it's attending the mile race, whether it's, you know, doing something else that God lays on our heart. But ladies, we need to be using the knowledge we have. And I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm going to say. But, more than another Bible study, we need to be using what we have to reach the lost. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a group of women that would meet together saying, what need can we meet this month? Yes, it's good to study the Word of God. Yes, it's good to come into Women's Fellowship. Yes, it's good to come to Wednesday nights. It's wonderful to be on Sunday mornings. But, let's take that knowledge and apply it. Let's take everything we know and apply it. What happens with everything that you know? What, what happens when, when, we, when we get too much? We become lazy. We become stagnant. Let's exercise what we know today. What do you know today? Well, Marilyn, I don't know the Bible that good, but I know Jesus loves me. Use that. Here Jesus said he called the twelve to himself and he began to send them out two by two. And then look what he did. He said, I'm going to give you power over unclean spirits. I am going to give you power to attack the kingdom of the devil. Power! These two, twelve people without a college degree. They are going to attack the kingdom of the devil. He is going to give them power to walk up and cast out demons. And what they have at that moment is good enough. And ladies, what you have at this moment, sitting here at that table, is good enough. 
He's going to use you if you let him. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper, or their money and money belts. Leave your Rolex at home. That's what he said. Do you know, I love what Jesus said. He goes, I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about taking all the needs for yourself because I am sending you out and I will meet your needs. You talk to missionaries on the foreign field, the needs that God meets over and over again. They don't know how it happens. It just happens. God is taking care of them. He said, go to them simply and tell them honestly that I love them. But wear sandals but to wear sandals and do not even put on two tunics, the, the outer coat. Jesus is saying, just take your sandals and go. I will take care of your needs. And he said to them, in whatever place you stay and you enter a house, until you depart, stay at that place. Jesus is saying, if someone's opened up a home to you, then stay with that, those people that have said you can stay with us. Ladies, there are some of you in this room that have the gift of hospitality. Did you know that? Do you know that's a wonderful gift? You look and you say, I, I can't go here, I can't go the middle, but, but I got a spare room. I make a good, you know, sausage casserole in the morning. That's a gift of hospitality. And that's something you can do right from your house. You're the ones that are bringing in people. You're the ones that are going, you know what, I don't, but you can stay here. I, I have a place I'll share with you. Jesus said, if you find people like that, that have the gift of hospitality, Jesus said, stay there with them. Because they're not going to get tired of you being there. <laughs> they're not going to go three days, smells like, you know, smells like, what did they, they say? It did. After three days, it smells like fish, or it smells like rotten meatloaf, or whatever. They're not going to be tired of you. Jesus said, if you find someone with the gift of hospitality, stay there. Stay there. Stay in that place. And whoever will not receive you or hear you, and you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Surely I say to you that there will be more tolerable for the Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than the judgment of, for that city. Jesus is saying here, if you tell them about me and they refuse, shake it off. Do you know what we tend to do? I can't believe they said that. I can't believe it. Oh, I was so stupid. I can't believe I said that. Bible. Oh, I, that was even the wrong way to say it. I, I should have said this instead of that. The Bible versus this, not that. And we put all this on us. Jesus is saying, once you've given my word and you've done what you can, shake it off. Some of you in this room need to start shaking it off. You are getting discouraged and you are having your feelings hurt. Who do you think could have had their feelings more hurt and stop than Jesus Christ? Ridiculed, spit on. He kept going on. And some of us need to shake it off. You need to say, you know what? I did what I was supposed to do. I told you about Jesus Christ. And now you hate me? It's okay. I've said this before. If they don't like you because you love Jesus Christ, they never liked you anyway. So don't be thinking you lost a friend because you now love Jesus. They weren't your friend anyway. If they don't like you because you stand up for righteousness, they didn't like you anyway. Thank God you just found out about it. You could have been thinking, they love me, they love me, they love me. You know, that's not what a friend is. If they don't accept what you have to say, they start treating you cruel. They leave you out. That's what people do these days. They leave you out. You're not invited. Do you know what? Shake it off. You are a beautiful woman of God. And God is going to use you. But do not let people hurt your feelings and put you into a box so you be quiet. Don't let that happen. You keep that boldness of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And it says here, they went out in verse 12, and they preached that people should repent. What do you tell them out there? That they need to repent. But we do it with love. And that's the tactic. You know, th there's different ways to talk to different people. 
But no matter what we do when we talk to someone, always cover it in love. That you love them. And here it says in verse 13, And they cast out many demons without a college degree. How could that be? They're out there changing the world. They're casting out demons. They have the power of the Holy Spirit. They don't have a piece of paper hanging on their wall saying they're educated. But God is using them right where they are. And he anointed them with oil that were sick. They anointed those with oil that were sick. And what? They healed them. God said, you know what? With your willingness to serve me, I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you power to cast out demons. I'm going to give you insight to recognize when someone has a demon. And I'm going to give you power. When you pray for somebody, they're going to get healed. Well, that just sounds like a lot of fun to me. Doesn't that just sound like a lot of fun to you? Oh my gosh. The Lord's going, you know what? I'm going to use you. I'm going to equip you. Lives are going to change because you were willing to go out and serve me. And ladies, that can be your neighborhood. Your next door neighbor that doesn't know Jesus. You can go out and minister to them. There is places everywhere that need to know about Jesus Christ. And he said here that he gave them power to cast out demons, anointed many with oil that were sick, and they were healed. Verse 14. Now King Herod heard of him. Your reputation precedes you. On my front door, I have a little pumpkin. And it says, a good name is rather to be had than riches. Herod hears of Jesus. There are people talking about him. Jesus' fame is spreading. And Herod is hearing about him. Now King Herod, verse 14, heard of him for his name had come known and become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Therefore these powers are at work at him. Oh my gosh, King Herod is the one that had him beheaded because Herodias, his wife, wanted his head on a platter because she was married to his brother and then she decided she wanted to be married to him and so John the Baptist came and said, that's wrong. And she hated him. She hated him. And we're going to be studying whatever, what all she did here. But here... All of that time, this guilt has been building up in King Herod's heart. This guilt, what he did, what he did, what he did. And he hears about a prophet doing things, and he's so guilty, and he has such a bad conscience going on. He goes, that's John the Baptist raised from the dead. God knows how to convict, doesn't he? And here he hears the word Jesus. And he's like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, he's come back. This is John the Baptist. Verse 15, others said it's Elijah. And others said it is a prophet or one like the prophets. Verse 16, but when Herod heard it, he said, no, this is John who I killed. Who I beheaded. You're all wrong. This isn't Elijah. This isn't a prophet. This is John the Baptist. Oh my Oh my, a guilty conscience. Is there anything worse than that? No one's even telling him anything. No one's even trying to make him feel bad. But everything within him is just cringing because he knows that this is John the Baptist. Let us pray for the people of Iran to let Saeed go. And let that spirit start making them feel guilty. That they are imprisoning a man of God. Let's pray that those chains are broken. And though they know that they know they're messing with something from the living God. Let's pray, ladies. And here we see that it says here that he says, No, it's John that I beheaded. He's raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent to lay hold of John, bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias... His brother's Philip's wife, for he had married her. There was drama in the family. Mm-hmm. Don't you love the Bible? It doesn't sugarcoat. 
It just tells what it was. The wife of his brother was having an affair with the brother. And he ends up marrying her. And they're thinking it's okay. They're going to, you know, accept me. You know, do whatever. You know, this is now, yeah, well, they had problems. Now I'm married to her. And you know what? The Lord says here that he is going to give him a guilty conscience of what he's done. And he married him. And John rises up and he says it's wrong what he's done. And Herodias, the woman, hates him. And here in verse 18 it says, Because John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. The truth hurts. And sometimes, ladies, you're going to have to just speak the truth. You're going to just have to say, What you're doing is wrong. And I love you with my whole heart, but I know what you're doing is wrong. And I'm going to pray for you. Sometimes we have to stand up. And you know what? John the Baptist, I'm sure he knew he could be thrown into prison. I'm sure he knew he could be beheaded. But he stood up for what was right. Therefore, verse 19, Herodias held it against him and she wanted to kill him, but she couldn't. She didn't know how. But she lays in wait with evil thoughts. And your enemy lays in wait with evil thoughts to see how to kill you and watches you because you've stood up for truth and you have Jesus living in your heart and your enemy is watching how to kill you and will not rest until he attacks you. Herod feared John knowing that it was a just and holy man to be protected by him and when he heard of him and did many things he heard of him gladly then at an opportune day when Herod was on his birthday and gave a feast for his nobles the high officers and the chief men of Galilee and I'm going to talk to you about this for a minute but what I want you to look at is when it came to an opportune day Your enemy waits for an opportune time to attack you. And it knows right when you are the most vulnerable. Your husband's not paying any attention to you anymore. Doesn't even notice when you wear something new or you combed your hair a different way. Go to the gas station, you're pumping gas. Cutie patootie, he's over there pumping gas. And he looks over and he says... You're looking good. (laughs) This whole thing. (laughs) And we we get all excited. Thanks. Thanks. You you live from around here? Oh, yeah, I live here. Do you live here? And all of a sudden we start talking. All of a sudden they become a good friend. An opportune time to trip you. Looking for an opportune time. There is a specially made trial and temptation just for you. Because he's studied you and he's watching you and he goes, watch your trip now. I'm going to be very honest with you this morning. I did something I wasn't really happy about the other day. And to be transparent with one another, that's what women do, right? Well, I went to this place and I was pumping gas. But I was going to pump gas, but I pulled in the wrong way. Really? Is there a right and a wrong way to pull into a gas station? Evidently there is. <laughs> because this lady walks up to me and she said, you pulled in the wrong way, you have to go back in line. That, back in line and, and get back in line and, and go and, and come in the right way. It's really... She goes... And then it's on. You know how you do? It's just on. (laughs) And she goes, really? Okay. So I get out, and I take my car, and I wait in line again. Now, this time, another 15 minutes goes by. I get up. I get out of my car, and and I'm going to pump my gas, and I'm getting ready to pump my gas, and your pastor, Gerald Hagerman, calls me on the phone. So I picked up the phone. I'm pumping the gas. She walks back up. She goes, excuse me. I go, yeah. She goes, you can't talk on your phone while you're pumping the gas. I 
I go, excuse me? She goes, you can't talk on your phone while you're pumping the gas. I said, why? (laughs) She said, you could blow up the gas tank. I said, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to blow up the gas tank talking on my phone. Okay? This is not the Gestapo. I'm just trying to buy gas. She walks away. I put my, I said, I got to go, Gerald. I got in trouble. I hung up. By this time, my patients are kind of getting, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm getting there. And so I went to swipe my stupid card, and it doesn't swipe. So I'm standing there, swipe, 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 swipe. Guess what I do? I get up. I walk over to where that attendant was. I said, Beans, how you have nothing to do except follow me around. You want to come help me get my credit card and do so I can pump gas? She said, I suppose. (laughs) Was that designed just for me? Did I lose my peace? You betcha. I got Gerald on the phone. I go, you will not believe what I just had to put up with. Just to pump gas. You will not believe this. And I just knew the enemy was going, gotcha. Gotcha. He looks for an opportune time to distract you, to make you uncomfortable, to have you lose your temper over small, stupid stuff. Let alone the huge trial, the huge temptation that's made for you out there. Just day-to-day living can be hard, can't it, ladies? And so here we see that the truth was being shown, and it waited, she waited for an opportune time. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in, she danced, and it pleased Herod and those who sat with him. The king, to the girl, asked, Whatever you want, I will give it to you. I cannot explain it to you as good as I can show it to you. So if I can get Dory to turn off the lights... And we're going to watch something happen here that was happening back then that is easy now for us to wrap our minds around. So, that is what happened. There's some very sick things going on there, ladies, if you think about it. He likes his stepdaughter. He's eyeing his stepdaughter. And the mother is encouraging the sin because she is evil and she wants the head of John the Baptist and there's a sick relationship here with the mother and daughter the mother has a a hold of that daughter to where even if she dances for something and someone says I can give you anything you want why wouldn't she say I want money I want a kingdom I want a palace I want you to divorce my mother and make me your queen. She could have anything, but there was a sick relationship here. And the mother told the daughter, you ask for the head of John the Baptist. We look at this and we think, oh my gosh, you know what? That's nothing compared to what's happening today on MTV. Bruno Mars, he used to have some cute songs out on the radio. What about, I should have bought her diamonds, I should have danced with her, I should have took her to the parties, now she's gone. He has a new song out called Gorilla. It's the most disgusting song you probably have heard in a long time. Yes, it says the F word, it tells how they make love, what she should do with her legs. This is number something 20 on our charts right now, making it up to number one. Let me tell you something else. The video to that is pornography, and it's popular, and all our kids on um, Jim TV are watching it. And it has a girl, and she's doing a dance on a, la- on a pole, and she backs up against this pole. She spreads her legs out to Bruno Mars. That's our pornography of today. But see, ladies, it was around back then. There's nothing new under the sun. 
Isn't that true? Isn't that what the Bible says? And here we see Herodias' daughter with herself came and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him. Ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. He also swore, whatever you ask of me, I will give to you, even taking your mother's place. Because she had half the kingdom. He said, I'll even replace her with you. She went out and she said to her mother, what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came into with haste to the kingdom saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. This is what Salome is saying. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the sin trapped him. He was inflamed, engulfed, and immediately the sin was a snare. And that's what sin does in our lives. At first it's fun, it's exciting, it's, and then we're addicted. Or then there's a problem. Or then someone finds out what we did. And then we're trapped. Immediately King Herod was sorry that he had said that. Because now he used to kind of get pleasure out of hearing about this man rallying out in the wilderness. He'd even heard of him several times. And now he has to send for him. Even though he hated what he said about him, he was amused by him. Now he has to send to get his head on a platter for this dance that took maybe 20 minutes and ruined the entire life of his. We never want to be those people that encourage our children to do bad. Or to wink at sin in their lives. We don't want to be the kind of parent that just doesn't say anything. Anything we say to them, of course, has got to be covered with love. And telling them you love them and this is why you're saying this. But you know what? We have to be that godly influence. And here, this woman was using her influence for evil. And she was raising up her daughter to be evil. And teaching her evil things. But you want to know what's interesting here? It says, And the king was sorry, yet because of the oaths made between the woman and the oaths made with others watching him, he caved to peer pressure. The woman was in charge of the home. Ladies, we are not to be in charge of the home. We're to have our husbands be the, the head of the household. Especially those that have godly men as husbands. Let them be the godly men. We don't want to control and raise up and come over their heads and figure out a way for always for us to have our way. Because we can be crafty. Herodias was pretty crafty. She waited to get her way. She's like, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. And at the opportune time, she seized it. And here we see this family, this unit is so out of control. And here it says, because of those that were looking at him, he didn't want to refuse him. Verse 27, immediately the king sent an executor and commanded him to have his head brought. And he went in and he beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter. Can you imagine the scene? We just saw all of this and immediately he sent someone down to the dungeon, found John the Baptist, cut his head off, went and got a silver platter and brought it up as a gift to the girl who just excited him with her dancing. Isn't that just sick? And here we see what sin will do. Sin will lead you to do things you never dreamed you'd ever dream of doing. When the disciples heard of it, they came and they took away his corpse and they laid it in a tomb. We want to be those that are encouraging our children to fly. We want to be mommies that are encouraging our children to fly. Not to stay with us until they're old. Even though we want them near us until they're old. Not to say, you know, you do everything I say to do. When they get a certain age, ladies, we need to let our babies fly. And encourage them to fly right. And pray for them and love them. 
This mother was sick in many ways. She was evil. She wanted her daughter to do everything. She said her daughter, she, she controlled her daughter. She controlled her husband. She waited for opportunities to do mischief. She was an evil woman. But we want to be those godly women that when they get a certain age, you know, what kind of mother would, would say to her daughter, you do this, when she could have been a rich woman? She could have taken care of her in her old years. She could have had everything But she was so controlled by her mother that she said, you go tell them that you want a platter. You want that platter and you want that head of that Baptist. That's what you do to her own hurt. We want to be godly women that lift up a godly standard and we encourage our little birdies to fly when it's time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, God, where there's so much in 29 verses. Oh my goodness, so much. Father, we lift up our society today that is evil, just like it was then, Father. Just a different uh, media that covers the world, Father, now. And it's so blatant and so open, Father. And it's, uh, it's on our airwaves, Lord. And Father, we pray for the Hollywood industry, God, that you would do a radical, Father, a radical movement there through somebody. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for each woman here today. Be with them as they're in their group speaking in your precious name. Amen.